good morning. Well, I am so glad that at least some people are still here in, in town over the Thanksgiving holidays, and I hope you guys had a great one. Today, I'm, I'm really excited that you're here because we're going to be talking about one of the most important of the churchy words of all. I'm not exactly sure how we ended up with the Trinity being talked about on Thanksgiving weekend when so many of our folks are traveling, but I'm so glad that you are here. This is an incredibly important concept. It defines who we are as a Christian church. And guys, there's really, there's really no word that we've talked about that is as, as important and monumental as this word, Trinity. And I'm just glad that you're, you're here. We are called to worship the God who is, not the God who we want or imagine. In fact, the very first of the Ten Commandments, God says, have no other God before me. Don't make up a God you can understand and all. Worship the true one. And a lot of times you guys will hear me say, we're going to major on the majors and what? Minor on the minors. And we've looked at some things like predestination and free will, if you remember that. And I said, guys, strong believers disagree on exactly how all that works. Today, this is a major. This is a core essential of who we are. And that can be a little scary because this can be a little bit difficult to understand. Theologian Karl Barth said it this way. Trinity is the Christian name for God. Now, sometime you might run into somebody and they go, well, you know, the, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Well, when you hear something like that, you just need to understand that's coming from ignorance and a lack of understanding. You see, words are simply verbal symbols for ideas and concepts. So there are all sorts of words that theologians have come up with to describe what the Bible teaches. Words like omnipresence, God is all present, or omnipotent, he's all powerful, or incarnation. All these are words that, that are eschatology, the end times. These are words that men have made up to describe what the Bible teaches. The same thing with the word Trinity. Now, as is apt this morning, since we're talking about the Trinity, the message has three main points or divisions. We're going to talk about who the Trinity is, who the Trinity is not, and then why is this important? Why is the Trinity so critical? And I hope that this morning you not only come up with a better understanding of the Trinity, because that's critical, but that you're, especially those of you who are followers of Christ, that you come with a much deeper appreciation and love and adoration for this incredible triune God. Now, very quickly, before we jump into the scriptures, let me give you two warnings. First of all, the Trinity is not just a theological idea. Guys, we're talking about a real God who's a real person who's right here with us. And he has a mind and will and emotions and he loves us. And we're not just talking about him that he's like he's off someplace. Have you ever been in a conversation where people are talking about you like you're not even there? Or maybe they don't know who you are? It's a weird feeling. A couple of years ago, after I, I first uh, came on, on staff here, they asked me to preach for the very first time downtown. The church was in an interim and um, uh, Frank Page was the interim pastor. He was out for Sunday, so they asked me to come down. And several days later, I was at a little community gathering in our neighborhood. And so I'm just talking to some folks. And, um, and I asked them, I said, well, do you guys go to church anywhere in the area? They said, oh, yeah, yeah, we go to First Baptist Simpsonville. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people say that, and they never show up at church. You ever notice that? <laughs> and so I just decided to play along. I don't know what. You know, sometimes your mind does terrible things. So anyhow, I said, really? Is that a very good church? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's great. And I said, now, do y'all have a, don't y'all have an interim right now? Yeah, 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 Frank Page is our interim. I said, well, did he speak last Sunday? They said, no, no, no. This new guy out at one of the campuses spoke. I said, really? I said, well, how did he do? <laughs> huh? And they said, and one guy said, 
Well, he was actually okay. You know, it wasn't, wasn't too bad. And I thought, okay, I'm really in deep here. So I better come clean. I said, well, thank you very much. And they went, oh, you're him. You know, it was, I was not at the place where, where they thought. So you ever been in a place where you're talking about somebody and then they're right there or there's somebody talking about you? Well, guys, we're not going to be just talking about God like he's off someplace. He's right here. And so we approach this with great honor and great respect and, and, and great, hopefully, wisdom. Michael Reeves, who's an author, uh, expressed a basic problem uh, or our basic problem with the Trinity. He says, the Trinity is seen not as a solution and a delight, but kind of as an oddity and a problem. Guys, He's not, this is, he is alive and right here and he's mysterious and wild and in charge of the universe. And I don't want you just to know about God. I want you to know him personally. So that's the first warning. Let's realize he's right here and we deal with respect. Secondly, I mean, just say right up front, the Trinity's not simple. Amen. Um, now, I know my job is to take complex theological ideas and constructs and teaching of Scripture and make them understandable, and I'm going to do the best I can today, but I'm just going to say right up front, front, God is not fully understandable. There is a mystery here. He has decided not to create anything that is just like him because only he's God. He hasn't created anything that's three in one just like him. Um, and I love this quote by St. Augustine. He goes, if you can comprehend it, it's not God. All right? So you're going to have to, as my, one of my teachers used to say, put your thinking cap on today. We're going to be kind of digging in. But here's the reality. Most of life is not simple. Okay? Your family relationships are not simple. Right? You just got through Thanksgiving. Um, your body's not simple. Every system is not simple. Every cell in your body is not simple. DNA is incredible and amazing. I mean, you walk around with a, with a smartphone, and it's not simple. I mean, I talk to it, and it talks back. That's weird. <laughs> I don't understand all the different functions, but I don't go, well, I don't understand it, so I'm just not going to have anything to do with it. It's amazing to me that somehow we understand that life is incredibly complex, and yet we want spiritual things to be so simple and easy. Well, if God does this and I just don't understand it, I don't know if I can worship a God like that. Come on now. Do you really want the God of the universe, the true God, to be more complex than your cell phone? So he's a mysterious, awesome, wild, fierce, loving, grace-giving, amazing, mysterious God. And we're going to explore some of that today. So we're going to look at two passages of scripture. Guys, I could have picked 50 and we could have just spent the whole day looking at scriptures. But two this morning, one is Matthew 3, beginning verse 16, where you're going to see the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all interreacting as one God, but with different roles and different personalities and different persons. So here we are at the baptism of Jesus. And verse 16 says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. And with him, I am well pleased. So in this one little place, two verses, you have Jesus, you have the Spirit, and you have the Father all being a part of exactly what God is doing. Let me give you another passage. This is in John 14. Jesus is teaching the disciples. And Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, that, and that'll be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father? He, no, see, he doesn't say the Father and I are the same. It's not the same being. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And the words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me 
who's doing the work. Now believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. And very truly I tell you, anyone or whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in, in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. Some translations have a comforter, an advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit is not a force. He is a person with a mind and will and emotions. So, you see Jesus is saying, well, here's the Father, here's the Son, and here's the Spirit, and they're all together. So how do we pull this together? Well, Christians historically have believed four things about the personhood of God. Four things. Number one, God is one. This is who the Trinity is. God is one. That means that God is, there's just one being. He is one in essence, one in, in being. Christianity is a monotheistic faith, a one God faith. The Shema, the, the, the statement of the Jewish people, in Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's only one God. Second thing we believe is that God is three. One God, three persons. But you want to summarize the meaning of the Trinity? Say it this way. One God, three persons. He has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they are all equal. They are all fully God. And they're all eternal. God has existed forever as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So God is one. God is three. Thirdly, God is distinct. God is distinct. Each person, Father, Son, and Spirit, is distinct from the others. They perform different roles. So listen to me, guys. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. They are distinct persons. Each, though, is fully God. And the fourth thing we understand is this. God is unified. God, again, has existed forever as one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, but these three persons exist in perfect unity. There is no division. There's no jealousy. There's no competing ideas or values. And you see this over and over throughout Scripture. The Father gives glory to the Son. The Son gives glory to the Father. The Holy Spirit lifts up Jesus. They're always giving and honoring and respecting and doing for the other. It is complete unity. I love to say that God's like his own perfect small group that has existed forever. He's his own perfect community of love and joy and companionship and encouragement. So, the Baptist faith and message, this is a summary of, of their statement. It says this. There is one and only one living and true God. Let me just stop for a second. That means if you're worshiping a God that is not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you're worshiping a false God, a different God, because there's only one God. 
Let me go back. There is only one, and there is one and only one living and true God. The eternal triune God reveals himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with distinct, there's that word, personal attributes, but without division of nature, essence, or being. And I know you kind of let these words sink in and you go, but how can that be? Let me read you kind of sort of the, the old orthodox. And orthodox means just historical, um, uh, true, uh, agreed upon statement or, or faith. The orthodox definition is this. One God who eternally exists in three different persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of whom are fully God, all of whom are equal. Now, as you can imagine, trying to explain this to people throughout the centuries, people have gone, uh, sure. How can that be possible? What's interesting, I mean, the early church, I mean, way back, we're talking about over a thousand years ago, came up with what they called the shield of the Holy Spirit. And um, uh, here's one of the earliest uh, illustrations of it that we have uh, from well over a thousand years ago. But since most of you don't read uh, Latin or Greek, uh, let me put it up here in English for you. Um, And you can see that in the center, there's God. And God is the Holy Spirit. God is the Father. And God is the Son. However, at the same time, the Father is not the Son. And the Son is not the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father. And both are true at the very same time. Now, whether it's this illustration that is an ancient one or it's the modern ones. You know, you hear people talking about uh, different ways of how do you begin to grasp this. And whatever illustration you come up with, it may help a little bit, but they all fall so short. You know, you know, they talk about the egg. You know, it's one egg, but it has a shell and a yolk and a white. Or it's like water. That's one of the ones I've heard early on. I've heard that, you know, that it's, it's uh, water, H2O. It's the same essence, the same, but it can, be, it can be ice. It can be liquid. It can be water vapor, and yet it's all H2O. Um, because all of those, you push them at all, they fall short of this incredible truth. That there's one God in three persons. Now what's interesting is there are some newer illustrations that are coming out as science is beginning to understand more and more about this universe. Of different molecules like nitrate that that all share electrons and you can't even capture it. It's symbol uh, of uh, in a description of how how the molecules and electrons all work in one way. You can describe it this way and this way and this way, but it's actually all three at once. Or about wave and particle theory, um, and wave theory says you know there's energy and and it's like particles and has attributes of matter and electrons. But you know what? The more I got into all the illustrations, they were so complex they didn't help. It was still confusing. But the amazing mystery is we serve this incredible God who's one God and yet three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's who the Trinity is. But let's real quickly talk about who the Trinity is not, who the Trinity is not. Now, figuring out the Trinity was one of the major tasks of the early church, and and again, Our human understanding, if we're going to come up with a God, we're going to go with stuff we can understand. So most cults and other faiths and everything else, they either go one way. They either go, all right, God is one God or God is three gods or many gods. One way you can know that what we have has been revealed in Scripture is that the Trinity is nothing any person would have come up with. It is way too difficult, way too complex, far beyond what anyone would have come up with on their own. But because it's hard to understand, different groups have gone to different extremes. So let me go to this extreme over here, which is God is one. If you go too far this direction, you move into a, what's called a heresy, which means a false understanding of who God is, what we call modalism. 
All right? Modalism says there is one God and he has just expressed himself as a single person, but he reveals himself in different modes or different forms. So modalism says, well, God showed himself or he took the mode or the form of the Father in the Old Testament and of Jesus in the New Testament and now as the Holy Spirit, but it's all just one God. And it so emphasizes the oneness of God, the persons are not distinct. It's like if somebody tries to give the illustration, well, God is sort of like a person. They love this one. Like, I am, I'm a son, and I'm a father, and I'm a brother. I'm all three at once, but I'm one person. The problem with that is, guys, that's modalism, because I'm still just me. That's just different roles that I play, like putting a mask on, but I'm the same person. This actually has, I mean, it's had uh, expression throughout history, and it still does today. There's a whole group called the Oneness Pentecostals. Have y'all ever heard of T.D. Jakes? He is a Oneness Pentecostal. He denies the Trinity. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit are just different modes, okay? That's an early, ancient heresy. That denies the Trinity. So that's on one side. Now, if you go to the other side, you come over here and you get tritheism. Tri means three. So this is an understanding of three gods. And what they understand here is God the Father is a God and the Son is a God and the Holy Spirit is a God and they're all three gods. They work together, but they're three gods, three separate gods. And they overemphasize the uniqueness of God. And that is also a heresy because God is not three separate gods. By the way, this is what both Jews and Muslims accuse Christians of. They say you worship three gods. You say God, the Father's a God, and the Holy Spirit's God, and Jesus is God. That's got to be three gods. And they misunderstand the Trinity. A modern day example of this misunderstanding is the modern Mormon church. They believe that God the Father is a God and they created Jesus as a God and Holy Spirit as a God and they are all separate persons and beings God. In fact, they actually believe that they create all other gods too. So it's not just tritheism, it's polytheism or many gods. Now, true Trinitarianism, y'all will hear me say this over and over. You've got to fight theologically and practically ways to live in the radical middle. Satan wants to push you to either extreme. And this is a great example. The radical middle is what Jesus and what the Bible actually teaches about any particular subject you want to come up with. And if you go too far this way, too much that God is one, you end up in modalism. You go far too far this way, it means you're in tritheism. And a true Trinitarian is, is a balance between modalism on one side and tritheism on the other, and they're both equal. He's fully one. He's fully three. Distinct, but fully unified. So God is not just one, and he's not just three. He is both. But let's come down and bring this down. So what? I mean, why does this? I mean, if I say this is a major, then what's the big deal? So what? This is critical. So I could give you 20 of these, and we're going to narrow it down very quickly. Five ways understanding the Trinity will change your life. Number one, Trinity changes our view and our understanding of God. The, the complexity, the beauty, the majesty, the mystery of the triune God is astonishing. So when we begin to worship him, we're only beginning to grasp what an incredible and mysterious and loving and powerful and, and magnificent and multifaceted God that he really is. 
And when you see the Apostle Paul trying to get a handle on this, it is just overwhelming. Let me just read you here Ephesians 3. This is verse 14. Listen to this. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ, listen, you've already seen the Father and the, the Spirit, and now Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of God's holy people to grasp. He goes, when you begin to grasp this triune God, begin to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God as Father, Son, and Spirit. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. He goes, guys, when you understand who this triune God is, it will blow your mind. It is beyond anything you can comprehend. Don't settle for a, a cheap imitation of a tritheism or, or modalism. You're worshiping a triune, perfect God. It changes your understanding of him. Secondly, it changes the way we worship. The Bible says, and Jesus said, we must worship him in spirit and truth. We're not to accept a false concept of God. So it changes that we're to worship one God, but in three persons. So we worship the Father and the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. The third way it changes your life is Trinity changes our prayer. You see, we don't just pray to God. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. All of the, the triune God is involved in prayer in our communicating with him. He is present with us when we pray. And the triune God, unlike any other understanding, gives us an unbelievable presence before God. You see, the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is interceding for you right now before the Father. Isn't that good news? Mm -hmm. Jesus is interceding, is praying for you before the Father. And sometimes we're in so much hurt and so much despair, we don't know how to pray. And look at this, Romans 8, 26 says this, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. And we don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. We don't even know how to pray. The Spirit prays for us. So right now, before the Father, both Jesus and the Spirit are praying for you. It changes the whole way you begin to understand prayer. The fourth way the Trinity changes our lives is it changes how we love others. It changes how we love others. You see, if God has existed forever as Father and Son and Holy Spirit, it changes the whole dynamic. We said several weeks ago, we're going through, you were created for community. Do you remember that? You were created for community. Why? Because you were created in the image of God. And when he creates you in his image, he is Father, Son, and Spirit. He is a community. God has been his own small group. God has been having a party of love and joy for all of eternity. And some people have said, well, that's why he created man as he needed and wanted somebody to love. And we know God can be holy, but if he's also love, then you got to have, that means you got to have somebody to love. So that's why he created man. He wanted to love someone. He wants somebody to love him. Guys, that's nonsense. God has himself through all of eternity. He had the Father, and he had the Son, and he had the Spirit, and they're all loving and caring and, and encouraging one another. He didn't need us, but here's the amazing thing. He invited us to his party. <laughs> And he's created you to love like him. Jesus said, I want you to love one another like the Father loves me. And like I love the Father. You're to love like Jesus. Husbands, you're to love your wife like the Father loves the Son. And the Son loves the Spirit. And the Spirit loves the Father. Wives, you're to love your husbands 
like Christ loves your husband. Kids, you're to love your I mean, this changes the whole way we understand love. It is a totally self-giving, self-sacrificing love. No jealousy, no ego. There's no, no friction or anything between the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. There's perfect love and unity. It changes the way we understand love. All of our relationships, because we're made in the image of a triune God. And fourth and last, it changes how we understand and experience church. Because we're not made three in one like God is. So he's created you for community. And he says, I want you to experience that as my people. So the more you understand a triune God, the more you understand and the more committed you are to the body of Christ, the more involved you are in your small group, your connect group, the more you're doing life together. People say, well, you know, my faith is a personal thing. It's just me and God. You don't understand the Trinity and you don't understand God. It's not just you and God. It's you and a family. It's you and a body. He's created you for community because God is a triune God. Guys, that just gets exciting. I I wish we just had time to, to stop and meditate on all the ways of who God is and how it impacts us. But let me just say again, doing life in the light and the understanding of the triune God changes everything. And God, again, has been having a party of love and joy for eternity, and that is amazing. And the amazing thing is, on top of all that, is that he has invited you to his party. He said, I want you to come into this relationship. But here's the thing. This is one of complete love and complete holiness, and there can be no one who has sinned. There can be no sin in this party. And that excludes all of us. And so it was the Father and the Son, and the Spirit, who came up with the idea of sending the Son, who would die on the cross for your sins and mine. And by the shedding of His blood, pay the penalty of our sin so that we could be justified, we could be covered with His righteousness so that He could take us into His presence and give us eternal life so that we could join this party of love and joy, and celebration with the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit for all of eternity. And so if you're here today, and you've never invited Christ into your life, we don't want you again just to know about God. We want you to experience Him and know Him personally. And if you're here today, and you are a believer, I hope today you leave with a deeper understanding of who God is one God three persons distinct but fully unified and that you will allow this truth to permeate your mind and your heart and let it change the way you worship and the way you pray the way you love others and love your family and the way you're involved in a part of church Because God has given us the most incredible gift, and that's the gift of himself. Isn't it incredible and amazing and awesome and wonderful that we serve a triune God? So if he's invited you to his party, let's get celebrating. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning that you are an incredible, awesome, amazing God. I pray, first of all, for someone here this morning who is here this, this Thanksgiving weekend and maybe they've never heard or thought about this kind of a God. God's been 
so simple or small or, or maybe so complex that it's scared. But today is the day. Somehow, deep inside, God, you have been drawing their heart. And if you've got a pull coming from inside, that is God the Father through the Spirit drawing your heart right now to himself. Would you give your life to him? Would you invite him into your life today, right now, as your Lord and Savior? And if you're ready to make that move, you can either mark that, that connect card and give it to me or Chris or come up and talk to one of us. I'll be in the front. Chris will be in the back. We would love to talk to you today about becoming a true follower of God. And for, Lord, I pray for every believer here that you will help us understand in a deeper way that you're one God in three persons and to rejoice into that and to celebrate that. And thank you, Lord. Thank you as we just come and worship you that you've invited us to this eternal party and celebration of holiness and joy all by your grace. And so we continue to worship you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me. In this time of invitation, I encourage you just to respond to God however he wants you to this morning. And let's worship him together.